go to the slideshow if I can get it to open. Well, things seem to be a little slow today. Okay, here we go. All right. First, I want to know, any questions or anything so far? Now, I've had a few questions about the test, which is imminent, coming up pretty soon. Um, you've had the first quiz, and I can't remember. I, just about all of you, I think, have turned in the quiz. If not, please get those in sooner rather than later. It's usually the people who aren't here that have to turn them in, but... Uh, so, um, try to get those in. Now, the test covers all that we've covered so far. The quiz covered the first three sections, uh, 1.4 to 1.6. The test covers 1.4 to 1.9, which we're working on now. Okay, so, um, the quiz was one page, uh, something around 10 questions. I don't remember exactly. Uh, the test will be two pages, something around 20 questions. Maybe not exact, but pretty close. The first page is not going to be far off from the material that the quiz covered. Okay? It might be a little bit of the second half stuff on the bottom a little bit. The first page is basically the same kind of stuff. Not the same questions, but it's going to be similar. Okay? The second page, and maybe a little on the bottom of the first page, will be on the last three sections. Okay? And I had a question. Basically, your homework exercise, your homework assignments are your best uh, preparations for the test. Now, someone asked about a uh, study guide. Remember, I think I announced this early in the term, but in case you've forgotten it, you get to bring with you at the test, and the book, the, class, the test is closed book, but you get to bring one page, which I call a formula and equation sheet. Anything you want to write on that piece of paper, that's your study guide, is what I'm doing that. Bring it with you, okay? Certainly calculators are permitted and encouraged, um, but anything you want to write on that piece of paper, front and back, one page, okay? Um, now, I've had some people, I don't see how they've read it. I mean, they typed it so terribly small that I couldn't read it, but if that's what it is. Now, let me also say this. One reason I do this, goodness gracious, I can't see in that light. All right. Okay. I can't find your name right now. Is it James? Okay. I went right past it. All right, anyone else come in since he called up? Okay, I was just saying, uh, the test is coming up pretty soon, and people were asking me questions, and I reminded everyone, I hope I had said this before, you can bring with you for the test one piece of paper with anything you want written on it. A formula and equation sheet is what I call it. You can put anything you want to on that, and that's, uh, and you can certainly have calculators, okay? So, uh, first page will be a lot like the quiz. Second page will be uh, covering pretty much. There may be a few questions that go over uh, the last three sections. Okay. Any questions on that? Now, one other announcement I wanted to make to y'all, but I will I don't know when this is going to be recorded. I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, it, I'm recording it now, but when it's going to be on YouTube, I don't know. Uh, as soon as this class is over, I'm out of here, okay? We've got a um, uh, wedding on them. Our nephews is getting married in Dallas, Texas this weekend, and the events start tomorrow, so we have to fly out this afternoon. So, uh, well, I forget it. let me get diamond, right? Okay. And uh, so... As soon as this class is over with, I'm out of here. Okay, yes. Good deal, thank you. Okay. Are we getting the quiz back today? Um, oh, okay. I don't, I don't need to see that. Huh? That's fine. Um, thank you, though. Um, not everybody's turned in the quiz. Right now, there's one, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven people have it turned into quiz. And I can't turn back the quiz with the correct answers on them. Uh, and then people who haven't turned it in see the correct answers and basically go with your course. Now, if you want to see me right after class, I'll let you see your quiz, but I gotta take it back. That's true for everybody. I wish you'd ask this on Tuesday. I had more time then because I have to book out of here just as soon as possible. But I, we won't have the test. I don't think we're going to finish this section today. And if we don't, then the test is probably going to be Thursday. So you have a chance to see it on Tuesday as well. And I will be in my office for, I, I won't be in the office for office. That's what I'm going to say. This afternoon, normally 12.15 to uh, 4.45, not going to be here. I'm going to be in the air going to Dallas by that time, probably, or at least loading by that time. Uh, yeah, at the airport by that time. Then uh, the trip also has influenced the next Tuesday's office hours because my next two classes, uh, differential equations, linear algebra, uh, we made up the, on Tuesday, we made up the differential equations today. We did a double class on that, and one class in linear algebra. Next Tuesday, we'll do one class in differential equation and a double linear algebra. So that means Tuesday my office hours have changed a little bit from uh, normally 12.15 to 4.45. Tuesday they'll be 1.30 to 4.45 because I'll make up that extra class. Then. All right. And then, of course, tomorrow I won't be on campus at all. I'm usually on the Birmingham campus, but I'll be in Dallas. Hopefully. Okay. All right. Any other questions? And that's why I said I don't know when this is going to go to YouTube because I'm recording it now, but it's not going to finish uploading because I'm going to have to leave and it doesn't upload when, you know, it's not uh, connected. So uh, I'll take the computer home with me. I'm not going to have time this morning before we leave. Hopefully I'll get to take it. We're packing and packed awfully tight. If I can squeeze it in my bag, then I'll take it with me. And then when we get to Dallas, Hopefully the hotel will have wireless or internet or something that I can't upload from there. But it probably will be late. Okay. Normally they're uploaded within a few hours. This one will be much later. Okay. And on worst case, if I can't take the computer, it'll be next week, Monday, before it uploads. All right. Any other questions? Good deal. And for those who came in late, when the test, which will probably be next Thursday, we'll see how things go today. Uh, but you can bring with you a formula and equation sheet, anything you want to write on it. Uh, somebody called it a study guide. That's a good thing to call it. I was starting to say this as well. Uh, and Nakia. Okay, anyone else come in since called off? Here's what I was going to say before. This thing of writing up your formula equation sheet, study guide, whatever you want to call it, a great study tool. Whether you get to use it or not, in this class you get to use it. But I found out when I was an undergraduate, and it didn't happen often that a professor allowed me, allowed the class to have a formula equation sheet. Man, that night before I was writing everything, organizing things, making sure I, I got down to the stuff I thought was most important and stuff like that. Uh, getting it, crowding it in and stuff, and then the next day when I took the test, I almost forgot to look at it because that was the best review I could have done, organizing material, writing it down. Writing it down is active learning. Reading it off the page is passive learning. You, you retain it much better actively. So a great idea to do a formula equation sh sheet for any test you ever have to take. If you can't use it, don't take it with you, okay, but it's still a very good very good study guide, study aid. Okay, enough of that. Any other questions? All right, <clears throat> we're picking up then at the top of page 85 in section 1.9. We talked about this last time, what in the world is an inverse function? We gave several examples, uh, sort of what sounds like the physics question, uh, final exam, uh, half your grade depended on it, and it was just a two-question final discussion, unfortunately. Number one, define the universe. Number two, give three examples. No, never mind. Okay, we won't go there. So, we've, 
going to define inverse functions. If f and g are any two functions in the world such that f of g of x, and we know what that means, that's a composite function, f of g of x happens to turn out to be just the uh, identity function x for every x where? In the domain of g. That's where this x comes from. For every x in there, f of g of x is equal to x. Okay? In other words, whatever g is doing to that x, f undoes it. Okay? That's what an inverse function does. But that's not enough. And g of f of x is also equal to x. So this is for every x where in f's domain. G and f may have different domains, but it still has to be true that g of f of x. So whatever f is doing to that value x, g undoes it and gives you the x again. Okay? Under these conditions, if both of those hold, then the function g is called the inverse function of f. The function g is also denoted by f inverse. f with a superscript of minus 1. So, here's the other way, rather than call it g of x now, f of f inverse of x is equal to x, and f inverse, which is work on g, of f of x is x. So that's really the way we usually refer to it. The domain of f must equal to the range of f inverse, and the range of f must be even equal to the domain of f inverse. They have to fit that way, otherwise it's not an inverse function. A lot of blah, 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 right? Let's see if we can do something with it that makes it a little more tangible. But, <clears throat> before we do that, do not be confused with the superscript in minus 1 denoting f inverse. Okay? Now, if this were x to the minus 1, what would that mean? What would that mean? x to the minus 1, or y to the minus 1, or 3 to the minus 1. What does that mean? A negative exponent for a number or a variable means... You move it downstairs, 1 over x cubed, 1 over 3 squared, you know, whatever it is, okay? That's what this normally means. But if this is a function, that doesn't mean reciprocal. For a variable, for a number, it means a reciprocal. For a function, it means inverse function, not reciprocal function. Okay, so don't confuse it. Maybe my just saying it made it confusing, I don't know, hopefully not. If the function g is the inverse of the function f, then it must also be true that f is the inverse of g. So, a function is a, if the function has an inverse, then it is the inverse of the inverse. Okay. For that reason, you can say the function g and f are inverse functions of each other. Okay. Again, a lot of blah, blah, blah. And no examples. Shame on me. Okay. So I think we're ready for example two. Oops. And also for people who came in late, I will be leaving right after class. No office hours today or tomorrow. I've got to take personal leave. We're going to a wedding in Dallas, Texas. So not uh, your flights out sometime early this afternoon with all the requirements. Have to be at the airport, I think, by something like 10.30 or leave house at 10.30 or something like that. So, got to book it as soon as this is over. Now, here is example two. Which of the functions I'm going to write down is the inverse of this one? Let me get my pen correctly activated. Here we go. Here's your function. F of X equal to 5 over X minus 2. Okay, here's the options. Here's a g of x, and this g of x is x minus 2 over 5, and here's the h of x, and this h of x is 5 over x plus 2. Now, just looking at that, would you have a guess of which of those would be the inverse function? So again, g or h? G is the reciprocal function of that, so the odds of it being the inverse function are pretty slim. But let's see. There is a test. How can we tell if it's the, if it's the inverse or not? 
Say again? Okay, plug it into what? Okay, F of G of X. Okay, see what that is. Now, what is your G of X? That would be F of, and what's G of X? X minus 2 over 5. Okay, that's what G of X is. Now, we're going to operate on this thing with the F function. The F function takes whatever is here and does that to it. So it starts with what? The F function starts with a 5 divided by whatever is inside here. And what's inside here? X minus 2 over 5. And then it subtracts 2 from that. Okay? we got a little bit of work to do. Okay? Now this is what, back in maybe Math 100, probably, or high school, in high school or somewhere, you had what they call, I don't like the name for it, complex fractions. It's fractions within fractions. Now, I don't like the word, use of the word complex because that usually means imaginary numbers. Okay? It's not anything imaginary here. So I call them complicated fractions. Now I have students say, oh, fractions are complicated. No, they're not. These are more complicated. So how do we simplify this complicated fraction? What's your first guess? Okay, and how would we do that? Second? Oh, no, 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 we're not solving anything. There's no equal here. This is just defining this. We're simplifying. Second? Okay. You're, you're getting close. When you said that, I thought you were going to mean find the least common denominator, work this out, and then, then reciprocate the next multiply by that. That would be one way to go. But I'm a little lazy, okay? So I like a little bit easier way, okay? Second? I can't hear you. You certainly could. That's you know, always a good idea. But here's what I would suggest. Here's my way to approach most of these. A few times that other method will work. This will almost always work. Look for all your denominators in both the numerator and denominator. What's the only denominator in the numerator? One, five over one. Okay, that's good. How about denominators in the denominator? Five. That's the only one you got. Okay? Once you found that, all the denominators, find the least common denominator, and since that's the only one we got, that's it. And then here's what we do. Here's the trick, okay? Once it works, we'll call it a method. We'll multiply by that denominator. And this is where I think putting it in parentheses is probably a great idea, okay? So the numerator becomes, oh, and by the way, how can I do that legally? Multiplying numerator and denominator by five. I mean, is that legal? Uh, top and bottom. Because what is five over five? One. When can I multiply by one? Anytime I want to. It doesn't hurt a thing. It doesn't change the problem. Okay? So that's what I've just done. So the numerator becomes 25. Now the denominator, <laughs> denominator, the denominator takes a little more work. Okay? You've got to distribute the 5 inside the both of those. And when you multiply 5 times x minus 2 over 5, what happens? You lose the 5. So you're left with an x minus 2 minus 10. Very good, because you multiply the 2 by that. So this gives us, oops, I meant not to do that, 25 over x minus 12. Okay, now what were we hoping? the f of g of x is going to be? For it to be an inverse function? x. Does that look like there's any way in the world you can make that be an x? Don't think so. Erase the 25 of the t No, that won't work. Okay, so that doesn't work. So that is not an inverse function. And neither is Jared an inverse... No, I didn't say that. Okay, Jared's here. Good deal. All right. So we rule out g. So now we're beginning to think it might be H. But let's see. We've got to verify it. So since I wrote over here, I need to erase some of that. So G's out. Whoa. 
All right. G is out of the picture here. It's not equal to F. F of G of X is not equal to X. No way in the world you can make it happen. So what are we going to try with H? You tell me. Say again? Into what? F of? Of H of X. Very good. Okay. Now, what we do first is plug in the innermost thing, H of X. What is H of X? It would be F of 5 over X plus 2. And what does that do? The F function starts with 5 over whatever is inside the parentheses. What's that? 5 over X plus 2, minus 2, right? It looks pretty nasty, but things are looking up, because what do you notice right off the top? Yes, 2 minus 2 is 0, okay? And that leaves us 5 over 5 over x, and what does this, that horizontal line indicate? Division. So this is the same as 5 divided by 5 over x, right? And how do we divide fractional forms? 5 times x over 5. And what does that happen? You get x. Ding, 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 ding. Okay, looks like we have a winner. Or a wiener one, okay. Now, technically... To verify that this is an inverse, that's not the only thing we need to do. We need to do one other thing, technically, okay? And what's that? We verified that f of h of x was x, but we also need to verify that h of f of x is h as well, is x as well. So let's try that. Ooh, I just don't have much room. So what I think I'm going to do is, since G was out of the picture altogether, let's get rid of this side and see if we can squeeze it over here. Okay? So we're looking for H of F of X. And you tell me what I need to do first. Say again? Okay, I think Brianna has her favorite phrase. She advertises Blade. Plug it in, plug it in. Okay, so that's going to be H of, and what's your F of X? 5 over X minus 2. Now, what does H tell you to do? You start with, start with 5 divided by everything that's inside that parentheses, right? So that'll be 5 over 5 over x minus 2, right? And then to that, we add 2. Isn't that what h of x says? 5 over whatever is in the parentheses plus 2. Got it? So here we have a division, a lot like we did before. Anyone want to make a guess what that's going to come out being? X minus 2, exactly. You invert this and multiply, right? The 5's go out, and you just have X minus 2. So this becomes X minus 2. Then add 2 to that, and what do we get? X, all right, because the 2's go away. Okay, so sure enough, the H of F of, H of X is equal to X, and H of F of X. Remember back when we first did composition of functions? We said most of the time, a function composed with another function, if you reverse those, get a different function. These, you get the same function. These make it special because they're inverse functions of each other. All right, so that was example two. There is a checkpoint there. Not a bad thing to go home or leave the classroom, and as soon as you can, do it, okay? So next thing we're going to do is a graph of an inverse function. All right? Um, 
if you were to graph f and its inverse function f inverse, they're related to each other in a pretty special way. Now remember when we first started talking about inverse functions, if you define the function as ordered pairs, how is a function related to its inverse in terms of ordered pairs? Yeah, you just flip them. The x becomes a y, the y becomes the x. So if the point a, b lies on f, then guess what? That guarantees that b, a will be on f inverse. Because that's what inverse functions do. They reverse the x's and y's. It must lie on that, and vice versa. That means, I don't know if you know this, it wasn't intuitively obvious to me when I first did it, but that means that the graph of f inverse has to be a reflection of f, but it reflects across the identity function, the f y is equal to x. That's what you did. You flipped the two, so they reflect across here. So what you're saying here, if you go over to the right, a units here, and find b up here for f, that means for f inverse, you go over b, which is that distance, and then go up A, which is that distance, and there you find B A. So you see they are reflected exactly across the diagonal, Y is equal to X. Now, two things I want you to notice from here. Number one, the way they drew it here, F is what kind of function? Always Increasing. And F inverse is always increasing. It's just at different rates, but they are increasing. If one's increasing, the other is. If F were decreasing, then F inverse would also have to be decreasing. So you can't see that from here, but it, it, that is a truth. Okay? The other one we're going to get to in just a few minutes, but that's one I wanted to point out to you. We call a function that is either always increasing or always decreasing, a monotonic function. Mono means one, and tonic, I guess, means one direction. <laughs> okay, I don't know what it means, okay? So it's only going one direction. Increasing or decreasing, so is the inverse. Okay? Surprising, but true. Okay, now example three then says, sketch the graphs of the inverse functions. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. F of x is equal to 2x minus 3, and they tell us that f inverse is 1 half of x plus 3. Uh, do you want to take their word for it, or do you need to verify that? Say again? What's that? You want to take the word for it? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's not hard to verify, but it takes some time. So let's just take the word for it. So let's uh, plot these two on the same rectangular coordinate system is show that the graphs are reflections of each other about that line. So, now this is, I wish I had graph paper back, the other system I used to use, Tegrity, had graph paper, but we've got this fan, nice fancy new system that doesn't, okay? I'm not bitter though, okay. Now, how do I plot f of x? What color you want that, black, is that okay, or you rather have a different color? Second? Okay, so let's plot it in black. How would you go about, let me just tick off a few points here. That means make them mad, tick them off, you know. All right, these aren't very evenly spaced, but I'll do the best I can. All right, how would you start plotting f of x equals to 2x minus 3? Where's a good place to begin? What kind of function is that? Linear function. And when you write it in function form, it's automatically in what form? That's called function form. There's a name for that. Slope-intercept form. So what can you tell me about that function, that linear function? Two pieces of information. You just said them. The what? The y-intercept and the slope. What's the y-intercept? Zero, negative three. Excellent. Okay, right there it is. And the slope is two. And what that means, you go 
up to for every one you go to the right. There's another point. Up to for every one you go to the right. There's another point. Up to for every one you go to the right. There's another point. Up to for every one you go to the right. There's another point. That should be, and by the way, uh, down to for every one you, but I don't have enough room. But sure enough, that should be pretty close to a straight line. There's your F. Now the F inverse, I do want to write in a different color. So you pick me a color. Say again, red? Okay. Bright red. I think. Yeah, okay. Now, I don't like the way that looks. Okay, I'm going to rewrite that ever so slightly as one half of x plus three halves. Now, I don't like that either. It's got fractions in it. You can't avoid that. Why did I write it that way, you reckon? Now, it's in slope intercept form with parentheses, it wasn't quite. Okay, so what can you tell me about that? Oh, I wish we hadn't have done red. Can I change it? No, we can leave it. That's all right. Go ahead. What's the, what can you tell me about that one? Graph. The slope is one half and y intercept is? Which of those shows you the best to, to plot first? Slope or y intercept? Y intercept. How can you plot a slope if you don't know where it starts? Y intercept gives you a place to start. So where does that start? Say again? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Three halves is one and a half, isn't it? There's your y intercept. Now your your uh, slope tells you you go up one for every two to the right. So there's one. Two to the right would be right there. Okay. Go up another one, and two to the right would be right here. Up again. One. Two to the right would be something about there. And I'm running out of room, so I think we'll stop there. Or we could go down one and two to the right, left would be here. Down one and two to the left would be there. Down one. And lost. There we are. And to the left would be here, and I'm about out of room. So somewhere here, my, I, I don't have this done too well, but there's our F inverse. All right, give me another color. Blue, light or dark? Dark, okay, there's dark blue. Now, I want to plot one more function. Y is equal to X. Help me do that one. Y is equal to X. Give me a few points. Zero, zero, I got it. Another. Say again. One, one. Two, two. Three, three. Four, four. Hey, I think I got, and then negative one, negative one, negative two, negative, okay. I think I got the idea here. Actually, I probably should do this a dotted line because that's not really, it's a, just a construction line. It's not part of the thing. What do you notice about this? This one reflects over that exactly the same. All right? You go load. The increase in function. One's increasing sharply, one's less sharply, but they are increasing function. In fact, say something more since these are linear functions this one the slope is two this one the slope is one half which is <coughs> and these are inverse functions maybe that notation isn't too bad after all you see how that works all right good deal let's see how they did it so let me clear this out of the way is that all right to clear it okay there it is. There's the graph. They didn't use color graph. They need gray and black. Okay, okay. The gray function is your f of x, 2x plus 3. And then the f inverse, they started at a different values than I did. And sure enough, they got the same slope, one, one half. And it crossed there at 3, 3. And it reflects across the y is equal to x axis. That's why. 
first said, oh, no, Dread for this, or usually I use Dread for the dog in that. But it's okay, you don't have to. It appears that the graphs are reflections of each other in the line y is equal to x. You can further verify this reflective property by testing a few points on the graph. And look at this, they put them in here. Negative 1, negative 5, negative 5, negative 1. 0 is negative 3, negative 3 is 0. 1, negative 1, negative 1, 1. 2, 1, 1, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, and on and on and on. Sure enough, they both work. <coughs> Inverse functions of each other. Understood? All right. And the funny thing is the, the uh, F operating on F inverse and F inverse operating on F are going to get X. And that's the, the uh, mirror, you might say. All right. Notice the following. Okay, we just said this. We did it on the graph. They just look this way. Here's the graph points to this one. If you put a negative 1 in here, you get negative 5. You put a 0 in, you get negative 3. You put a 1 in, you get a negative 1. Put a 2 in, you get a plus 1. 3 in, you get a 0. Look at the inverse function. Put a negative 5 in. Negative 5 plus 3 is? Negative two, half of negative two is negative one. Okay, exactly the reverse of that. Put a three in, a negative three in there. Negative three plus three is zero. Half of zero is still zero. Okay, just a smaller zero. Okay. Put a negative one in there. What do you get? Two. Half of two is one. See, exactly the reverse of this. Put a one in there. What do you get? Four. Half of four is two. Exactly the reverse of that. Put a three in there, and what do you get? Six. Half of six is three. Or three, three, and three, three. Those are, they're not the same. They're just reflections of each other. Never mind. Any questions on that? All right. Now, that was example three. They are skipping example four. I think let's do example four here. Sketch the graphs of the inverse functions f of x. Let me go back to black. Okay. f of x is equal to x squared. Now, they do something bizarre here. They put in parentheses what this is indicating domain x greater than or equal to 0. Why? f of x equal x squared, what's its domain usually? All real numbers. Okay? But in this case, we're restricting the domain to be only zeros and positive real numbers. Okay? Not all real numbers, just that. And here's why. Here's your f inverse. What would you think the inverse function of the squaring function would be? The square root function. Good guess. But what can you tell me about the square root function? You can't take the square root of a negative number, so therefore you have to restrict this to a positive number. Okay, well you still, you wouldn't say, that's the, that shouldn't affect this any, but it does too, because if this is restricted to a positive number, when you take the square root, what does that symbol mean? The principal are positive square root. Those are always positive. So therefore, since the output here has to be positive, that limits your input here to be positive. That's where that came from. Not the fact that x has to be uh, greater than or equal to 0. It's the output of f inverse. Okay. They didn't make a point of that. I just did. Okay. Now, what we want to do is plot those on the same rectangular coordinate system and show that the graphs are reflections of one another. So, let's do the plot here. I know where it's going, so I can put it down here. We'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, positive 1, 2, 3, 4. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, we don't need all those. Okay, might need a few. Let's plot your f of x. For, ooh, 
silly me. Let me change this. Okay? Sorry about this. I wasn't thinking ahead. Far enough, anyway. Okay. Whoops, I just wiped out my F2. Okay. All right. Let's, let's make this my y-axis. Okay. Now, the reason I did that, I already know X has got to be positive or non-negative, and and the uh, output of that is going to be positive, non-negative. So why not move the origin over there? Okay, you tell me a few points to plot for this one. Say again. Zero zero. She picks the hard ones first, doesn't she? Okay. Next. One, one, oh boy. Two, four, that would be right about there. Nine, that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, somewhere right around there. Four, sixteen is going to be off scale, right? So this is half of a, what do we call that shape? A parabola, very good. Okay, something like that. I don't draw too well, okay? How about the other one? What color you want to do it? Different color, you pick it. Pick me a color. Purple, all right. Okay. Now, this will be the purple one. Give me an X. Four, okay, she chooses four. And what's the square root of four? Two, so that's right about there. Give me another X. Nine, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Give me a, what is the value? Three. I think it's right about there. I, yeah, that looks about right. Give me another one. Okay, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I'll scale, sorry. How about smaller? Would you like the hard numbers? One. And what would that one be? One. And? Zero is zero. Okay. Now, do you remember how this looks? This is half of a sleeping parabola. Okay. There we have it. These are both sort of dark, but I think you can see the contrast. And it's said to show that that reflects across what? What color you want this? Red, maybe? Red. All right. Good choice. Okay. Re what is the line y is equal to x? Give me a few points there. Zero, zero. One, one. Two, two. Three, three. Blah, 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 blah. Do they look like they're reflecting across that line? Sure enough, they do. Okay. I didn't have quite enough bulge in here, but the bulge here represents the bulge there. They cross here, they cross there. Zero, zero, one, one. Sure enough, and guess what? This one is increasing in this power function, and this one's increasing just at a slower rate. You got it? Make sense? Now, I think we did that. You could pick the points and show that they're reversals of each other. We could have done that. Obviously, let me go back to black here. Uh, this one's zero, zero, which is a reverse of each other. This is one, one. That's a reverse of each other. This is two, four, but this one was four, two. This one was nine, three, but this one was three, nine. So you see they are, they do interchange the X and the Y. Hang on to that concept, okay? There are checkpoints after these two, too. I would suggest going home and doing those, okay, or going to the library, going to another classroom. What You can stay in this classroom. There's no class here and work on some of these. All right. Next thing we're going to do are one-to-one -one functions. Are any of you familiar with these at all? Maybe not. These are sort of new concepts here. It sounds familiar, okay. 
Uh, actually, we've been doing them. Okay. The reflective property in the graphs of inverse functions, remember? One has a reflection on the other. Gives you a geometric test for determining whether a function has an inverse or not. Now, you need to do this on the graph, but that's how we chose whether a function was a function or not, right? What test do we use then? Vertical line test. Okay? Now, if this function is going to have an inverse, then its inverse has to be a function, right? <clears throat> now let's go back to that last one we did. Remember the x squared function? I said its domain is all real numbers. But if we tried to plot that like this, is that a function? No, it fails the vertical line test. So therefore, for a function to have an inverse, not only does it have to be a function, pass a vertical line test, it must also pass a horizontal line test because the function can't back up on itself. If it did, then its inverse function would not be a function. So that's contradictory, isn't it? So this is a horizontal line test for an inverse function. A function f has an inverse function if and only if no horizontal line intersects the graph of f more than one. Remember what we were saying about it has to be increasing? If it's strictly increasing, it passes vertical and the horizontal line. If it's strictly decreasing, it passes vertical and the horizontal line test. If it backs up on itself, it fails. Okay? If it has any loopy loops in it, it can't do it. Yeah, exactly. A horizontal line test would be a horizontal line can't touch it but once. No more than once. The vertical line test says it can't touch it more than once. Also, you're right. Okay, if no horizontal line intersects the graph at L more than one point, then no y value is matched with more than one x value. So therefore, we call them one to one. Right? If you have an x, it can only have one y. We do that. But now we're saying for every y, only one x as well. This is the central characteristic of what we call one to one function sort of circular reasoning here, a function f is one to one when each value of the dependent variable corresponds to exactly one value of the independent variable. It's just like the definition of the function, but we swap these two words, okay? To be a function, each value of the independent uh, variable has to equal ex exactly one value of the dependent. To be one to one, it goes the other way as well. Each dependent only has one independent. The function f has an inverse if and only if it's one to one. Horizontal line test means it's one to one. If it passes that, it's one to one. So these two say almost the same thing. Make sense? All right. So let's look at some functions. Here's f of x equal x squared, and we're not limiting the domain here. Would you say this table is correct? Give me an x of Negative 2, what do you do? F of x? 4. x is negative 1? 1. x 0? 0. x 1? x 2? x 3? Okay, is that a function? Yes, you're not repeating any of the x's. Is it a 1 to 1 function? <coughs> okay, yeah, that's true. No, it isn't. And here's here's the others. Just looking at this definition, here are two ones that give you different here. Okay, before it's a function because you don't have this repeated here, but it's not a one to one function because you do have repeated values here with different values there. That that makes it not a one to one function. Okay. Oh, surely I can come up with something more difficult than that, can I? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's hope so. Yeah. <laughs> is that like, is that like square root divided by 1 or something? Uh, okay. It, that is a good question. Here's what you got to do. In fact, we'll do it in a minute in, in the example. You first have to, before you try to see if the function has an inverse, you need to make sure it's a 1 to 1 function. So what you do is either graph it or plug in values and say, no, that can't it's not a one-to-one -one function, don't even bother with the inverse. It can't have one. So 
So that, yeah, you have to do it first, but I'm not going to say, here are functions, are they? You know, you have to do that. Yeah, exactly. You work it out. Exactly. Okay. Good question. He's looking ahead. Okay. The table on, okay. I didn't do this table. This they changed. They reversed the X's and Y's. And when they did, they moved everything here to be the X and everything here to be the Y. If this was an inverse function, that would be what you did, right? Is this now a function? No, because you have repeated values here with different values there. Okay? That wouldn't be a that wouldn't be a function. So therefore the inverse is this isn't one to one. I mean we set up by every way we can, but that's what's going on here. The, when you reverse the um, x's and y's, you must still have a function. That one does not. The table on the right does not represent a function because the input x equal four, for instance, or x equal two, um, one uh, is matched with two outputs. Y is equal to negative two. Y is equal to plus two. Y is equal to minus one and plus one. So f of x equal x squared is not a one-to-one -one function on the whole domain. If you limit the domain to where it is strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, then it does have an inverse function. But you have to limit the domain for that to happen. Okay? But by itself, the whole function is not because it fails the horizontal line test. Here's a graph of a function. f of x equals x cubed minus 1. What do you think about it? 1 to 1? Say again? Yeah. Yes. Well, look at it. Horizontal line test. Half of everything. Line uh, it looks like it might be a little iffy there, but sure enough, if you blew that up, you would see it does have a one to one correspondence there. So, yes, that's a one to one function. That does have an inverse. I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but it does have an inverse. Because no horizontal line intersects the graph at more than one point, this is a one to one function. And uh, it does have an inverse. Did we skip? No, we did example four. So, all right, that was example five. Well, that's five a. Okay, here's five b. This function is does that is that a one to one function? Yeah. No, it isn't. Fails the horizontal line test. Here, 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 here. Passes here, but that's the only place, and then doesn't even intersect down there. <coughs> so that. That's not a one-to-one -one function unless you restrict the domain. If you restrict the domain from zero to positive infinity, yeah, that's a one-to-one -one function. Or from negative infinity to zero, that's a one-to-one -one function. But not on the whole domain, it's not a one-to-one -one function. Okay? Make sense? All right. That was example five. All right. How are we doing on time? Got what? Ten minutes. Fantastic. Let's get going on finding inverse functions algebraically. Before this, we were guessing and testing and guessing and testing. Oh boy, that got sort of old. Let's do it algebraically. Okay? For relatively simple functions, they say, such as the one in example one, where you just make guesses on them, you can sort of do that. For more complicated functions, however, it's best to use these guidelines. Now, these are not super strict, but they all represent some of the things you have already seen. And they say the key step here, I don't count the steps. They, they number them, but I do them slightly differently. Interchanging the roles of X and Y, that's what makes an inverse function, isn't it? So that's going to be the key step, they say. This step corresponds to the fact that inverse functions have ordered pairs with the coordinates reversed. So here are their... Things. Now, I do it slightly differently. I don't number them quite the same way. They say, number one, use the horizontal line test. Guess what that implies? you got to graph the function. Okay, how can you use the horizontal line test if you don't have a graph to look at? So either graph the function, or there's sometimes you can just think through a function and say, no, that has to be one to one. But you've got to do that. Use the horizontal line test to determine whether f is one-to-one -one or not. If f is not one-to-one, -one, it doesn't have an inverse. If it 
is one one who does. Okay? So I would say step one is graph the function or analyze the function to see if the hard problem run ever passes. Okay? Number two, in the equation for f of x, what is f of x? Y. Okay, that's why it's pretty important. <laughs> Replace f of x with y. Okay? That's pretty easy. We've been doing that from the beginning. Now, this one I break into two steps. Okay? Two steps. Text no, no. The interchange the roles of x and y. That's the one they were talking about. Then, solve for y. Why did they put <laughs> this is one step, that's another step. So, step three is still the important one. Interchange those two, but then you solve for y. Once you solve for y, now your y, since you swapped them, that's now f inverse. The y up here was f. When you plot them, the y becomes f inverse. And then finally, this is important, verify that f and f inverse are inverse functions of each other. And this is a two-step process. You first do f of f inverse. Then you do f inverse of f. If both of them equals identity function x, you got it. So actually, I expand this to be about seven steps. You know, they say five, but they count. This is one step. I count it as two. This is two steps. Okay. But you can count them any way you want to. So here is example six. Let's do this, the steps pretty much. First thing we got to do is what? Verify it's one to one. Okay. Now, you could graph this. Before you graph it, though, I would rewrite it slightly. Let's see what color? Okay, I'm still in the right color. And I would rewrite this as 5 over 2 minus 3 halves x. Would you agree with that? Did I do that correctly? And then I sort of don't like the way that looks, so I'm going to write it as minus 3 halves x plus 5 halves. And then I ask you a question. What kind of function is that? Look at them. That's a slope intercept form, so that makes it a linear function. And the slope, here's the key, the slope is not zero, is it? The slope is negative 3 halves. So what does that tell you about the function? It's a straight line going downhill. Somewhere here like that, maybe like that. Okay, guess what? That's one to one. I don't have to graph it. I can see it's a linear function. The slope is not zero, so therefore, when it says happens to be a negative slope, it's got to be one to one. Now, if you want to graph it, it's not that hard to graph. It's got fractions in it, but you can do it. But look, just look at that. Show yourself that's a linear function with a slope, non-zero slope. It's got to have be one to one. Does that make sense? So I'm lazy. I'm Avoid graphing if I can. So that was step one. What's the next step? Okay, replace the f of x with y. So what does this become? Y is equal to? Okay, you could do it. Well, let's go back to their way. 5 minus 3x over 2. That was easy. Just change the f of x to y. We've been doing that all term, right? What's the next step? Okay, flip the x's and y's. So what does that become? x is equal to 5 minus 3y over 2. Now what? Now you solve for y. Okay? Whew, this is going to be a little more involved. What's the first thing you better do? Solve for y. Isolate the y. You want a naked y there. Nothing around it. So what do we do? Multiply by 2. Great first step. Multiply this side by 2, but you got to multiply that side by 2 as well. That wipes out your denominator. Good first step. That gives us 2x is equal to 5 minus 3y. Again, you want to isolate the y. What do you do next? Subtract 5 from both sides. So that gives you 2x minus 5 is equal to negative 3y. Divide by negative 3. Divide by negative 3. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to do a little sleight of hand here. 
These go out, so this leaves me y is equal to, I'm flipping sides now, and because I have a negative down here, I'm actually going to negate both of those up there. Flip them around and have 5 minus 2x over 3. Okay, you see what I did there? You negate this by um, changing the sign of both of these and that. So that becomes negative 2x plus 5 over 3. And then put in the plus in front, 5 minus 2x. Take your time and do that as many ways. You don't have to do that. You can leave it just like this. It's perfectly fine. But that's the function. Now, if you wanted to get at that in slope intercept form, you could, but it's not necessary. They gave you the f is that. Oh, what's the next to the last step? This y now becomes f inverse of x is equal to 5 minus 2x over 3. And then the last, I call them two steps. What you got to do? Verify, check it, make sure it works. And how do you do that with inverse functions? Okay, the graph gives you a visual idea, but how do you do it algebraically? Okay, what do you plug it into? What are you investigating? F of... f inverse of x, remember? And what would that be? f of, and you just found the f inverse to be 5 minus 2x over 3. Now the f function takes, starts with what? Starts with what? They've done this all day. 5, okay. 5, if I could write, Minus 3 times what? Whatever is in your parentheses. What you're in your parentheses here is 5 minus 2x over 3. And then you take that and divide it by 2. That's what the f function does. It does 5 minus 3, what's inside here, divided by 2. So let's see if we can do that. What's it look like a good first step? Three and the three will be one. So you wiped out your threes. So that gives you five minus five minus two x over two. What's five? Let's clear that parentheses. That would be five minus. 5 plus 2x over 2. 5 minus 5 is 0. Da! Bingo! Oh, you can't say that in Alabama. Equal x. Okay? So you verified the f of f inverse was x. Now what do you have to do? <laughs> yes, I know. Isn't it fun? You have to do the f inverse of f of x and see what that is. So let me clear some. Oh, this is fun. Okay. So let's, uh, come on, where is it? There it is. There, okay. So what would that be? What do you do first? F inverse of, what's your F of X? Maybe hard to read now. Okay, there it is. Okay, 5 minus 3x over 2. Okay, and what does f inverse? Here's your f inverse down here. What does it start with? A 5 minus 2 times 5 minus 3x over 2, all that over 3. And again, your 2s go out. Ultimately, your fives go out, this becomes a plus three, the threes go out, and you got an x. So sure enough, it works. Sorry about that, I did that really fast, okay? But we have now verified it, and that's where we'll stop today. That was example what?
it wasn't example six. <laughs> that was example six on my, um, on the old slide set. It wasn't example six in the book. Why didn't somebody correct me there? Oh, okay. He has an excuse. Not a great one, but an excuse. Okay, we'll pick up with example six next time. All right. So it looks like we will be... Let me give you a few homework exercises here. I know you'd hate it to have the whole weekend with no homework, okay? Oh, we are that close to finishing. We got two examples to go. So do any of the odds 7 through 11. Do either 13 or 15 or both. Uh, 17 or 19 or both. Uh, any of the odds 21 to 31. Uh, 33, 35 either 37 or 39 or both, any of the odds for or either 41 or 43 or both, and then the ones we just did, uh, any of the odds 45 to 55 and any of the odds 57 to 71. We'll end there and pick up the rest next time. Y'all have a good weekend. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, the instructions are there. Okay, it's in several places. That either first or second day of class, I went over the instructions. I remember it a little bit. I just okay, make sure so you can you can go to the uh, blackboard and go to the uh, link to the YouTube video and then do that. But it's also if you go to blackboard and under content, you'll find instructions for research paper there. You won't hear me talk about it. You can read them there, and then so you can either read it under research paper instructions. Or you can go to that first or second day of class and hear me talk about it. I promise you, I just got to print it out and make sure I do the website thing that they want to do. Yeah, whatever your format calls for, yeah. Whatever you want, yeah. either NRA, you know. It, it, either sure format, you any format you want. Be sure yeah. you get a cover page right. I don't care about a cover page. Make sure somebody comes in right okay. after the class. Right. Oh, excuse me. Oh, I didn't even know you. Okay, I'm sorry. I may have missed it. What is it? Oh, it was fine. Uh, I, the reason I missed class was because I was in a pretty bad accident. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, do you have the quiz? I was afraid you might not. That's why I kept mentioning it today, hoping maybe you would say or someone else would say, I don't have the quiz. But yeah, I can give you the quiz. I'll even not give you the key. Uh, you wouldn't like that. That would take away all the fun out of it. Okay, yeah, there's the quiz. Do you need graph paper? No, sir, I'm fine. You don't? Yeah, okay, good deal. All right, I'll have this for Wednesday. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Have a good weekend.